Hello and welcome to today's episode of Rock Code Live. I'm your host, Rock Code. Today we're taking a look at hacking Kubernetes, playing some fun capture the flags organized for us by our friends at Control Plane. Before we get started, there's just a little bit of housekeeping. So first, please subscribe to the YouTube channel and click the bell. This will get you alerts and notifications whenever we have new episodes of Rock Code Live. Next, we have a very active Discord server. Feel free to jump in there if you want to chat Cloud Native, Kubernetes, and anything in between. And lastly, thank you to my employer, Equinix Metal. They allow me to do this on their time and leverage their hardware when required. If you want to check out a bare metal cloud, use the code ROCKCODE. This will get you $200 of compute, which is around 400 hours on one of our more modest instances. All right, that is the housekeeping. Uh, today, I am joined by Andrew Martin, the CEO of Control Plane. Uh, hello, hello. I, I just I looked up and I seen your big cheesy smile and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't, I won't see it anymore. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and then we will get started on today's session? Sure. Yes. Hello. It's a delight to be here. Um, I'm Andy. I'm alcohol free at this point in time. <laughs> I um, I promise. And uh, yeah. Hi. I'm the CEO at Control Plane. We are cloud native security which basically means uh, we do DevOps and we try to do it well because DevSecOps and that layer above is just solid engineering. So very proud to have a very smart bunch of colleagues uh, doing interesting things. We have plenty of positions open if people <laughs> are interested, of course. And uh, yeah, my background is in low-level engineering and distributed systems. I came into security as a product of getting access to these systems and realizing that there was less than perfect coverage. Of course, 100% is never possible. So I was just able to follow my interest and keep on going down rabbit holes and untangling balls of twine. So that's how we find ourselves <laughs> here today. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. So what are you drinking? It looks like a beer. Ooh. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm almost carbon neutral, so I'm now trying to go alcohol neutral. <laughs> uh, if they would like to sponsor me, this is the <laughs> most crisp and beautiful of the uh, unfiltered lagers. It is 0.5%. Nice. Uh, it's a couple of really nice alcohol-free beers that I like, actually. Uh, the Erdinger one is really, really nice. Mm. And uh, the Brewdog ones are, are particularly tasty, too. So. Yeah. Right. I, the, Sorry, I the, the other silent magical beer is the uh, the Jupiler. Oh. And for many years of drinking in Belgium, I've accidentally bought cases of non-alcoholic beer before. <laughs> so now at the other end of my existence, um, I'm happy to, happy to say it's actually really quite good as lagers go. Nice. Awesome. So today we're taking a look at some of the CTF scenarios that you and your team at Control Plane put together. Is it the KubeCon ones? Yes, indeed. It is the scenarios from last week's epic KubeCon, frankly. The uh, the live streams that we did, one of which you were a part of, were just fantastic. Really thoroughly enjoyed doing them. And uh, we didn't have enough time to finish everything. So we will run through them all end to end. Awesome. Well, I actually didn't have a chance to partake in the CTF last week, um, except for what we did on the, the live stream in between where we had a little play. Uh, it definitely gave me a wee taste for it. I was like, oh, I should do more of this stuff. So I'm really excited that we actually get to sit down together uh, and do this together today. So uh, you have sent me some rather sketchy and dubious bash stuff to <laughs> stick in my shell, which I did without blinking an eye. So there we go. We're going to see how we get on today. Uh, I've got this link from the CTF. I mean, can people still do this in their own time or is this something that they'd have to send you loads of money for? There are two versions, of course. We are open core for all of this. So there is an open source project called Kubernetes Simulator. And that fundamentally is a provisioning engine, aka Terraform, of course, and a load of nefarious scripts that run through and misconfigure, um, I guess, security contexts and the definitions of what's running in a pod and various, various other <laughs> things that miscreants may or may not take advantage of. So that open source piece is used for the CTF. Yep. Uh, it is beholden upon me to patch the changes back into that. So that will be done next week because I had to take a breather. Yes. And 
to actually run this at scale, we've built a load of um, distributed orchestration around it. So we've run that for conferences, we've run that privately as well. But centrally, all of the learning experience is available through the simulator. And all the scenarios that we ran for uh, KubeCon 2020 North, uh, sorry, 2020 EU. No, it was North America. <laughs> intercontinental confusion are available on the open source version. So everything will be there, but no one can cheat for the CTF. So we don't publish them in advance. Got it. Perfect. All right. So this is the dodgy stuff you sent me. Uh, untars some configurations and SSHs me in to something. So I'm just going to hit KS play, let it do its thing. And we are in a shell, either in a container, on a VM, and somewhere, right? Is that is that all I need to know at this point in time? <laughs> that is a correct observation. Um, each, the, the penultimate, well, the last line of text there where your cursor is, tells us what the starting position is. Um, actually, you're you're kind of right about the layers of abstraction, but yeah, we only care that it's a pod right now. All right. Okay. So uh, I'm starting in a hashjack pod, which is in some namespace. It wants me to follow the captain and prove out his attack path to find a flag. All right. Yeah. There is this uh, arch nemesis, uh, sort of archetypal. Um, sailor of the binary maelstrom uh, and all this other nonsensical rubbish, who is this character that I've constructed uh, to write a book around, essentially. So that there's a book coming out in November called Hacking Kubernetes. And in order to give kind of threat modeling and attacking stuff more teeth and something a bit more realistic, this guy, Captain Hashjack, exists. You will see on the fourth line up how much effort I put into the uh, kind of UTF-8 spelling of the word <laughs> hashjack. <laughs> and joy of all joys, it renders in our terminals. Truly, we are in the future. Uh, yeah, so this guy, Captain Hashjack, has done numerous nefarious things with his motley crew of scoundrels. And the point of the CTF is to chase down what he's done and understand how he's performed these attacks in order to understand for ourselves how best we secure the cluster, how we chop off those branches on an attack tree, and how we model the threat model in an abstract sense, and of course, in the concrete sense of actually putting these controls in place. Okay. So should I just start pushing buttons or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. Okay, so I do see a process table that makes me think we are in a container. Uh, confirmed. This looks like a host disk. Uh, doo -doo -doo. All right. So it appeared to me that we can just mount the host disk. That is entirely correct. The uh, the telltale signs here are that <laughs> the container runtime would normally mask dev and so not give us full access to everything that is available on the host. Because of course, dev is a virtual kernel file system, is provided because everything in Linux is a file. And in a container, normally, we would not see lots of TTYs, <laughs> We know David is not a big fan of Unicode. Yeah, there was a clustered episode where uh, a fellow Scotsman, actually Guy Templeton, uh, ruined, broke the core DNS config by swapping out the O for a Unicode O that looked very much like it. <laughs> yeah, that's the uh, the original typo squatting, I guess. Ugh, painful. Anyway. Yeah, big time. Yeah, All so right. so we're Sorry, normally some really restricted, but <laughs> but uh, but yes, you are you are bang on. This is exactly where we want to be. So I guess, I mean, I've got access to the disk. I can just share it this. Um, I'm assuming I've now uh, Kubernetes, API. I've got the root cert. That's always a good sign. And I've got ability to speak to the kubelet or even 
probably modify. Oh, no, thank you. Oh, it was that it manifest. All right, okay. So, am I supposed to be looking for a flag, or am I just trying to take the roots there? It's like, I'm looking for something, right? Yes, there are flags littered across all the clusters. Uh, in this case, there's only one. Okay. And the uh, there's a vital piece of information which I should, in the spirits of fair play, share with you, and that's that the flags have a well-known format. So flag underscore CTF open curly parentheses, a hex block, and then a close parentheses. So it is possible if you have the time and inclination to find these flags. Some of them, it takes a, a little bit longer to find. So uh, sniffing around in some places is uh, is useful. Uh, I mean, I just check things that I would assume would probably be obvious uh, so what you like I'm, i mean i've never done like a real ctf right so if i was partaking in this are there any hints or advice that you would give to people like what should they actually be doing like once you get access to like the root disk are there common places paths commands they should be running things they should be looking out for that's a really good question the playing a ctf and avoiding or evading intrusion detection um, are, are quite different things. So if we were actually attacking a host system that we were, uh, we were red teaming, we had a legitimate reason to be, uh, to be attacking the system, of course, uh, which is the disclaimer on, on all of the, the CTF stuff. In that case, we would probably be trying to tread quite carefully. So um, we wouldn't necessarily be grepping for stuff, although that is, uh, frankly, the, the best way to solve a CTF a lot of the time. Uh, we would try and perhaps, depending upon our level of, uh, of defense evasion, I was just watching, um, uh, we were doing a SANS call earlier, and there was a really great presentation on emerging threat actors, and they popped up a SolarWinds slide. The SolarWinds slide, uh, the, the attack began getting on for a year before they actually dropped the Sunburst malware, or the Sunspot malware. So they were super stealthy. They were just doing one thing really cautiously at a time because, I mean, you don't want to trigger those alarm systems. In a CTF, uh, I haven't played a CTF with IDS. I think it's, it's a great idea and watch out for next KubeCon CTF, I guess. Um, but yeah, in, in this case, speaking personally, I go and look in places that uh, I would drop things myself, I guess. Uh, the root directory is normally somewhere that an administrator, if I've just got a Snowflake server, and uh, as you and I can probably recall from the days before wide automation and DevOps being uh, being a thing almost, we used to have to go on servers and we used to have to move keys around. We used to generate our certificates from the server itself. And the slash root directory is a, it's a place where root trusts, they only have access. Yeah. So, so something in here is um, likely to cause, cause problems for a, a, a flag defender, maybe. All right. Well, I love that I could see the kernel was AWS and I could hit the metadata API. I am, that would be fun. But I'm looking in this root thingy. And you said you wouldn't grep. Why would you not grep? In a CTF, I would. All right. But on uh, on a non um, excellent work, sir. Uh, I hate that I don't have my auto complete. <laughs> I know. Uh, CTF dot star. There was oh, there was something there. There we go. Very is good. This... That is it. Oh look, there's more more UTF eight. What a joy! All right. So if you just if you grab for the flag again, yeah, so it was in the up. authorized keys file, wasn't it? Yeah, you got it. <laughs> that is bashing this thing. 
There we go. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the flag is this nasty person has added SSH keys to the authorized keys so they have access to the host going forward. That is exactly it, yes. And this is one of the one of the ways to achieve persistence if you are just mounting the host file system. Because of course, without using NS Enter, we've only really technically cherooted or entered the the host's mount namespace. If you run a, a PS again here. You'll see. You'll see. You're still in the container. Oh, because uh, I'm bash. Chiroots told you the oh, the, yeah. the magic. I think. Um, yeah. So so. Yeah, precisely. So you're able to navigate that file system and pull all the things from it. Mm -hmm. But but we're still yeah exactly as you see we're still in the process namespace of the container. So the only namespace we've managed to break into so far. Is, uh, is the mount namespace. And that means to actually break out onto the host, we need to do one of a few things. The simplest is, uh, well, I say the simplest. We can do what we've done here, which is to drop uh, an author a public key into the host.ssh authorized keys for root. If we wanted to use that attack root on a modern system, we'd also probably have to enable root login um, for, uh, for SSHD, because that's not always enabled anymore. But we can do loads of things. Um, interacting well, with system D units is a bit more difficult, of course. Sorry to interrupt. I, I, was, I was only going to say, we, we have access to the Cetra Kubernetes. We have access to the Kubelet and the static pod manifest. So we, I mean, we could run a privileged pod in there, which would get us access to the, all the namespaces on the host. Yes, if we had NS Enter in that pod, then we could just blaze into all the namespaces. But because we've just because we're in a pod with that uh, slash dev access, which is normally because it's privileged anyway, that's the route we've taken. But yeah, exactly as you say, we could just run another container. Mm -hmm. We could just drop in a shadow pod that has the tooling that we want to break out onto the host. We could drop in a cron job, which fires off a reverse shell. We could mess with some of the system D units, although they might need a daemon reload and that would take longer. It's game over for multiple different games simultaneously. Nice. <laughs> uh, super cool. Excellent work. Okay, let us progress. All right, do, uh, I, need, the... do I need new, new things or am I done with yeah, this I... shell? Yes, that shell is thoroughly popped and no longer of any use to us. So here we go. And this highly advanced uh, targz based access provisioning mode is uh, is how we ran the, the KubeCon CTF as well. And uh, all credit to the attendees. Uh, many of them did question, what do we think we were doing? Just throwing around bits of bash and tables. Yeah, why not just put it on a uh, USB key and give it to them, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's coming in by pigeon. <laughs> uh, all right. So we're now in a second shell. I'm assuming, like, what, you know, the new people, they're joining CTS, right? The first five commands you should run, I'm assuming, are look at the processes, look at the mount points, look at. Uh, Maybe you want to see if you've got an sophisticated network or no access to the network. Like, what would, what would you run beyond that? Yeah, that, that's awesome. Um, I I have some useful collateral that I will share in a second. All right. But but the first thing is just to exactly like you say, check the mount points because they bleed so much of the abstraction of a container. From there, it's worth checking. Um, we can see in, in the process table if. Uh, if we are actually in a process namespace, yeah, precisely. So all good. Um, the, the network as well is super useful. We should be, we should have a pod. Well, rather, we should have a local Ethernet adapter that is on something that looks like a private range. It should probably also look like quite a small range because we assume it's a pod network. If it's not, then maybe we've got access to the host adapter. Um, there's also a super useful uh, bit of kernel 
jiggery pokery that we can do. So because we're, um, I, I, I check ID as well, just to see uh, what, uh, what we are. Okay, so if we now cat proc self status, then we can see some stuff in here that also looks a bit like what am I contained brings us. Am I contained is the canonical internal container observability tool written by Jess Fraz, who just shipped all the container security stuff right at the beginning. But we do have to pull a binary into our pod if we want to run am I contained. So proc self status will tell us quite a lot of things. Uh, we can see that we have no set comp enabled on the like seventh or eighth line up there. Uh, we can see some of the capabilities that we've got, although broadly uh, I, I don't decode those. Um, and then if we go up, there is, uh, we can see the UID. Of course, we can see that through ID as well. And it's some interesting information. To take this to the next level, the Am I Contained tool which will run um, in, a, in a later attack, will also tell us, it will take a best guess at which, um, which container orchestrator we're in. So let's try and guess which orchestrator we're in. Well, that wouldn't be doing justice to clustered and its obvious spelling hints, perhaps. But if we cat proc self C groups, singular, sorry, then we can see that the name of the C groups that have been created also give us a, a bit of a clue. And it's all this stuff around leaking abstractions that make containers at once super fast to spin up and beneficial and portable and useful, but then they're, they're not a perfect extraction, a abstraction. Okay. So is that the so, first the first thing to do is really just to gather as much information as you can before trying to move towards the flag, right? Yeah, exactly. All right, uh, I'm I'm going to show my naivety here. I didn't see anything here to reveal maybe which CRI implementation we were using. I do see System D and Freezer. Uh, does that mean we're using Container D? That's a really good point, actually. Uh, if these are stood up, I, I mean, yes is the answer, um, but I'm not a, I'm not convinced that, I'm not sure that QPods changes for different runtimes. I haven't, I can't actually tell you that offhand. Certainly if we were to run this via Docker, it would tell us that we were in Docker there. Right, okay. So I, I think you're, you're definitely on the right path. Yeah, I've, that's how I handle most things. I just say, I don't know and guess, so. <laughs> So I should just be prodding around, right? This is, um, I did see the mounts were, uh, it looks like we've maybe got access to the host again that way. Uh, yeah, maybe, let's see. Oh no, we don't, okay. That's how it should look. <laughs> All right, so what do we have then? Not a whole lot on this one. Uh, is there, I, I don't know what system this is. So let's see if I can work that out. Maybe that'll help me. So not an LSB file normally. I'd really like to go uh, asterisk rel into. asterisk. In it, yeah, that's it. Oh, I should at least, yeah. All right, okay. But it's a bit different for different, I mean, older OSs don't quite have it. So that star rel always tends to work. Nice. Yeah, I normally look for the LSB underscore release, but I guess star rel would cover that too. So handy. All right. So, so. yeah, w when you started off, you used the mount command, mm -hmm. which is super useful because it gives you all that extra context. And, uh, and if we go right to the top, I say right to the top, just slightly further up. Then it also leaks the overlay of fest. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's the Docker runtime as well. Yeah, okay. And uh, and so, so that gives us a bit more. Um, it's just something else that's leaking. 
However, this is super noisy because it tells us things about where C groups are mounted. So I always run both mount and also DF. And that tends to scream a bit louder when there is a service count. Yeah, we've got the secret being mounted in here. And it's kind of most of the time people don't unmount the default service count, which is obviously not a great look. It also means that a service count may just be unable to do very much by default, let's say. And someone also kindly left me kub control in this container. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes thinking of the user. Does that mean I can run? Oh, look at that. <laughs> Bazinga. Uh, at least there's some R back going on. <laughs> oh, we've got some uh, crypto miners going on as well. That's fun. That is the Badger. And uh, the context for this is that we've got unexpected workloads. Now, notably, just for some background with this one, the uh, this is more about attacking Kubernetes workloads and side effects rather than misconfigurations of the orchestrator. Doesn't really mean very much, does it? <laughs> Okay, um, so I need to work out what my next move is, right? Uh, yes. I mean, I can start poking around. Um, I can start executing into other pods, looking for maybe better privileges, like um, in the interest of time. Yeah. What should I do? <laughs> Those pods should not be running and stealing our compute resource. Let's shoot them in the head. Oh, wait, are we the good guys or the bad guys? I thought I was trying to get root. <laughs> we are the good guys following <laughs> the bad guys. And following this is what the, the bad, bad guys, guys have done. Okay. Uh... There are a good number of root targeted flags, but this is not one of them. Okay, so we want to delete some pods. I was going to spin up some more, but whatever. You've um, you've avoided the mistake that is easy to make, which is we are in fact in the hashtag <laughs> pod. <laughs> yes, because my my first instinct was to do a delete pod dash dash all, and I thought, no, I'm in this namespace. So, uh, although now that I've just realised I've deleted pods, which is probably rather silly because they are tuples, which would suggest there may be something else get deployed. Oh, I don't have access to that. But if you check the pods, yeah, they are coming yeah. back. So not stateful sets. It could be daemon sets. I don't have access to that. You're very much in the right direction. All right. Okay. So my my goal is to get rid of all these pods. Yeah, and right. between you and me. They are demon sets. Uh, no, they're not. <laughs> That's just instinctive. I'm so sorry. No, they're deployments. All right, but I don't have the access to the list of deployments on my current privileges. But you could probably elucidate their names. Ah, oh, so I just don't have list access. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Oh, look at that. All right. Incidentally, I'm looking to launch all of those coins. Really, I should have been a bit smarter <laughs> and just says, uh, auth can I list? And I would have seen that I can delete very nicely left as a hint there. And I was just being rather silly. But there you we go. got it. Uh, so that should mean they're all gone at least now. Or getting there. Is that it? Is it done? Almost. Almost. Uh, at the point that they make themselves scarce, uh, something will probably turn up in secrets. Uh, oh, there think... was a hashtag secret. I looked at that earlier. Oh, there's a flag. All right. Okay. I think uh, potentially this is managed by the world's. Ooh, 
going to make a big claim. The world's shortest uh, operator, perhaps. I found my flag. I don't know, you I got it. There. there we go. Cool. Excellent. Excellent work. Okay, let's keep on rolling. Here is your next scenario. So in this scenario, we have, uh, we're running internal container registries and the pirates have turned up, taken the registry down and left a secret in one of the pods. So this is a, this is a kind of, uh, screaming backflip through a flaming hoop kind of exploit where again we're just using what kubernetes gives us in an unusual way so is it hacking well of a, of a sort i kind of want to run that but um... <laughs> Echo hash jack. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, is that important? Should I be looking at that? Or is that just there for the... Is that an Easter egg? Uh, yes, it is not important for it's what not we're important. doing. Uh, I was hoping you were going to Rick roll me. But... Um, just you wait, perhaps. <laughs> uh all right, so we can see Docker CRI again. We have our overlay. We got our C groups. We got some disks. We have a service account. No IP command. All right, so. Do we have kube control? We do. People are always nice leaving all these tools lying around. It was, uh, yeah, feedback from last time, perhaps. <laughs> so they don't have to curl down the binary in every single pod. <laughs> all right, let's see. What do I have access to here? Um, well, we can create deployments. We can get logs. Um, in fact, we can get pods too. Okay. So let's see what else we have. Namespaced. Privateer one, two, and three. We do not have the ability to exec into another pod. But I'm assuming uh, we're creating. I... Do you want me to create something? Is that why I have the ability to create, create deployments? Yeah, that's it. There's the interesting thing here is the contents of the image. We can't get to that image, but we can run a pod using that image as the base. So it's then about, and this is the, uh, the screaming backflip. It's then about trying to, it, it's almost a blind injection attack. It's not quite, it is blind because we can't see the file system contents. It's kind of an injection, but we are still just running cube control. So that's perhaps a, overly dramatic wording but if we if we have a look at what's running in those privateer pods so dumping them as as yaml and grepping for mm -hmm. image they're running excalibur that is the badger So the goal here is to run a pod using that image. Do you maintain your own registry? This is the uh, the, the secret internal registry for the purposes of this. All right. The answer is absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, I cut you off. Okay, so no, no, it's all good. All right, so let's push me along a little bit here. I'm not sure what my next move is. So what we want to try is cube control run and set the image to be that crazy uh, <laughs> piratical image. And then, 
Yes, nice. Uh, we want, do we want a terminal? I'm not sure. Maybe just try double, ha uh, double hyphen. I'm not sure if we, yeah, okay. Um, and then. I don't know if IT will work on the run, but I figured I'd try it. It's it's worth trying, yeah. <laughs> Was there? Yeah, I can't enter because I, I don't have pod yeah. exec, which I kind of thought was going to happen. So the way that we can do this semi-blind, maybe it's kind of monocled half injection, is to check the log output. And the, the, the tool that I really love for logging is called Stern from a company called Worker that Oracle bought like three years ago. But this tool, Stern, um, I'll drop a link in, allows us to essentially specify a wildcard that lets us grep across any existing or future pods in any or all namespaces. We can't do that right now. We'll just have to use cube control logs. Well, we could, but let's not bother. And okay, so where are we? Um, I have to admit missing the previous command, sorry. Oh, I was running the logs against our hashtack too, but I don't seem to be getting uh, anything back out. And then I just decided to check the logs of privateer one, two, and three, but there's just sleeps. Oh yeah, it's going around in circles. Okay, let's have a look at this injection command. Could you pull up the cube control run again, please? Uh, yep. Yeah, this. Okay, so um, if we replace bash, if, in fact, go bash, let me think about this. Uh, if, if you can remove the IT as well, because I don't think we need an interactive terminal for what we'll do, and then double hyphen, and then we'll, we'll run bash again, bash space hyphen C, and then just put an ID in there and see what happens. Ah, right, okay, gotcha. And we've got a fun game here because we need a unique yep. pod name, of course, every time we do an injection. So yes, apologies. This is where Stern is useful. All right, root, root, and root. Cool. Okay, so Noel has very helpfully posted uh, another useful grep. So if we replace ID with the grep r flag CTF search, then we will find, and I think again, for the purposes of, of speed, searching in user share. So up to please. That's the badger, and then um, just Nold's last uh, last chat in the. That's the badger again. And then, if we use user share as instead of the root slash. That yeah. looks good to me. <laughs> Joyful joys. And we have a flag. Very nice indeed. Interesting points to note here. The Rick roll will be from a different line of the song every time. And oh. if you actually, <laughs> and uh, why uh, under God's bright sun would anybody ever create a directory name, which is a comma? Who, who only knows? Uh, but yes, congratulations. We are rocking through the flags. And we go to the next one. And there we go. Thank you. And we are in number four. Very nice. Now it occurs to me because of my exceptional timing, I may, uh, this cluster may self-destruct around us. Can you just check 
This is an interesting experiment. What does uptime say? 55 yeah. minutes. So this is uh, this will go in a, a blaze of glory very shortly. There's another one coming up, so we'll be able to transition between clusters semi-seamlessly. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but uh, let's, uh, sleep let's look what's happening here. No. Service account again. I'm assuming we're going to be following the same pattern here. straight in there well that's rude <laughs> yeah lulled into a false sense of insecurity i'm afraid uh all the, right yeah uh, the the back chat for this one is the supply chain is compromised and code has been merged into an application library that developers use the library runs in the in a pod Attackers have used that reverse shell that the pod threw to jump into the pod and find secrets mounted on the host. So somehow we need to get out of this pod and uh, and into a mount point. Okay. Cool. And we have four minutes. And I <laughs> and I have to say, I again um, uh, lulled you somewhere because if you go back to the PS at the top, now earlier on we both jumped into the same pod, and that meant that we had two bash sessions, or two bash processes running. Actually, what we've got here with two sleep sessions. Uh, processes is potentially an indicator of misconfiguration. Okay. Oh, there we go. Oops. See you later. Okay. What should we do? Uh, we will have the next one up very shortly. And if you just, okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so just looking at that, we've, um, the, the first thing to do, please, is to scroll back up to the uh, description. And and then just slightly further down. Now, just before we've typed uptime, it says use Qcontrol, describe, blah, 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 to see all of the containers in this pod. And the line above that, defaulting container name to audit, that comes from Qcontrol exec. That is not part of the scenario description. And probably in the spirit of fairness and goodwill, I should put a dividing line between the two so that's clear. <laughs> Right. But concretely, what that means is that there's more than one container in the pod. Cube Control used to not tell you this information when uh, when you jumped in, or, or give you less information. But now, with kind of one two one, yeah, yeah, it does. You can set the default container now, right? Yeah. So it in we go toward it. But actually, the uh, the container that we're looking for is in the same pod and somehow accessible. And that's uh, suitably vague, <laughs> not be of any further use without a cluster as well. <laughs> I wonder if we've got any more. So if I just send you one that we've been... <laughs> let's, uh, let's reverse back to the last cluster. We only need another couple of minutes before this comes back up again. But at least we'll have something to poke around that mind you saying that they were probably all spun up at the same time this is where i miss lewis <laughs> he never makes these kind of rudimentary mistakes uh all right so i'm deleting the old cluster and you want me to re-download the previous cluster which you've just sent me so i'll do that now although we suspect yeah, just... that that one may also go kaboom <laughs> Yes. Which very... is nice because I'm actually I'm wearing my Marvin the Martian t-shirt today. So things gone kaboom is encouraged. <laughs> it's only up 19 minutes. There we go. So that's, is that what you expected? Yes, because I was better at the beginning of this uh, video than I am at the end. 
So this might be an interesting time to pull Am I Contained? Fortunately, Jess does an awesome job on the releases page. Uh, genuine Tools, Am I Contained? That's the badger. And if you go straight to releases, she gives you a checksum validation. I mean, this is how software should be delivered, right? Everybody who was running CodeCov and not checking, and when I say everybody, everybody, even up to HashiCorp, the big boys. Uh, so we've got a permission denied. This is totally standard in containers. We often can't hit the file system locations that we want, but what we can do is, yeah, you, you got it. We can write to temp and that's, we can, we can grep the mount points for the string RW and that will just tell us if we've got a mount, if we've got a writable mount, as long as we don't have no dev. Oh, wait, let's try to download to, oh, there we go. That's yeah, we got it. Um, and the before it as well. Yep. Twice. <laughs> so th this kind of cat and mouse game of immutability on partitions is really not solvable. Applications need to drop PID files, lock files. They probably need temporary disk. You've probably got access to dev SHM, shared memory segment. Really, even GKE, which is super hardened and well configured by default, you can still find places to write runnable files. It becomes a lot easier to IDS detect the thing, but boom, okay, awesome. So if we remember what we had in proc self status, we've got a, a lot more visibility here. We can see has namespaces, PID, yes, that's a good thing. User namespaces, no. Hardly anybody has user namespaces right now because they're very complex. They cut across a lot of other namespaces because everything is a file and every file must have uh, discretionary access control, users and groups and blah, blah, blah. Uh, Kinvolk are doing a lot of work to bring user namespaces to Flatcar, which is the spiritual successor of container Linux or core OS as it used to be. That will be super awesome when they ship that. What else do we have here? App Armor profile, Docker default, you beauty. Very rarely is App Armor on by default in Kubernetes. So this is a very happy day. And we can see our bounding set of capabilities. This will give us an indication whether we're privileged to start off with, um, but, but also tell us things like we've got DAC override. That means we can change permissions on files in the same way we can with Chone. Um, we can make nodes, we can do cheroots. We, we've got a lot going on in there. Yep. And then, yep, sorry. No, no, I was just agreeing. Yeah, stuff, <laughs> thing. <laughs> App wow. Armor, SE Linux, love all that stuff. It's so easy to operate these days in 2021. Tell me about it. <laughs> and this is where the vendors make their money. Yeah, there, there are loads of things that I, I know are just good practice, but then, you know, so it's hard. Um, Big time. Yeah. There's, there are tools that will extract runtime security profiles from running applications, but unless those applications exercise the full set of production runtime behaviors, they're not going to build the right security profile. So there's this mysterious gray area where, uh, <laughs> where security operates, I suppose. Um, and, and often, there's some awesome tooling that's come out to support this, actually. Um, the uh, Aqua Tracy does some of this stuff. Red, Red Hat have a... Uh, they have multiple things. They have... Uh, man, I'm just... Uh, tool override. <laughs> so there, there's, a, there's a tool that will use eBPF to trace system calls to generate profiles. And, oh, um, nice. And so, I guess Falco could maybe do bits of that as well if you've got that running on your cluster. It's absolutely the same space. Yeah. I guess Falco reverse engineer. Yeah. And SecComp, I think, you know, with the SecComp operator and all the work that uh, Dan and Sasha are doing there, it's, it's getting a lot easier to run SecComp on Kubernetes as well, which is which is nice. I just wish people would do that for App Armor and SE Linux. Otherwise, I, I'd maybe stop disabling them. So. <laughs> Yes, Dan Walsh cries every time someone disables SE Linux. <laughs> but th there is a great tool to extract SE Linux profiles from deny events, uh, similar to audit to RBAC that Jordan Liggett built. 
I just can't remember what it's called. Um, I'm sure someone will find it. Um, I think Noel has commented. Is it Bane? Yeah, but Bane's great, but it's actually a, a pre-processor for, um, for App Armor, I think. He says, not having used it like that, so perhaps. Oh, I think I uh, missed his first comment. Uh, so I think that's also from Jess Rizal, and it's a tool for dynamically generating tech comp profiles for a binary, which is nice. Or unless I've just stitched two random comments together that aren't related. <laughs> uh. It's uh, it's in the right direction. Um, Bane focuses on app armor, and it's less of a reverse engineer. It's more of a, a DSL, so you can just... So you don't have to write app armor, basically. You can write kind of higher order language and, and have it compiled down. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, I mean, th this is where container security vendors, I, the next cluster is with you, by the way. This is where container security vendors have been operating for the past like five, seven, what year is it? Eight years. Um, and another great, I'm just dropping stats that I heard in a call <laughs> earlier. Uh, security operation centers that use open source tooling have a markedly higher talent retention rate. People like open source. Yeah, true. It's awesome. All right. Uh, so we're getting close to the hour, and I know your calendar is always a nightmare, so I don't want us to go over that hour. So why don't you guide us through this one, if we can do it in the next five minutes, and then we'll do a quick wrap-up and then... Uh, Maybe I can schedule yes. more of your time in the future to do a bit more CTFE fun. But... Absolutely. Uh, so SE Linux audit to allow is the one. Good spot, Waleed. Okay, so what are we doing here? We are... So you've told me that we have a second container <laughs> in this pod and we need to find a way to get access to the other container, right? Yes, that is entirely correct. Now, I know that pods share the net name space, but... I don't seem to see any way to confirm that, I guess. Self. So, yeah, well. You are, you're totally in the right kind of area. Right, okay. Go for it. Um, <laughs> because we've got those two sleep pods, we want to just have a poke around. And while PS shows us that we are in a process namespace, the question is who else is in our process namespace? By default, Kubernetes containers in a pod are in the same network namespace, the same interprocess namespace, but not the same mount namespace, uh, and not the same, um, and they have their own container file systems, of course, and not the same process namespace. In this case, we have a shared process namespace between containers in a pod. So if we go cat proc 12, because 12 is the PID of the other sleep process, and we could probably have found that by just doing an LS and seeing that we have a few numbers here. So is that how you would have done it? Yes, it or, should or always that, correlate. To... It would have shown me it here, right? You got it. <laughs> <laughs> See, sometimes I take the hard road. Uh, I don't think. Right, okay. Sorry, we're in uh, Proc 12. Go. Cool. Okay, so what we can do from here is see the root file system of the other process. So if we... Uh, let's start with cat and go into root, please. Uh, j just, uh, yeah, uh, root within this directory. All right. And then just start auto completing. So we've now got the root file system of the other container because the PID that is running in the other process namespace is now leaking that to us as well. This is by design. It's, uh, what? It's necessary. It's because we've shared the process namespace between the pods, the containers in a pod. So, I mean, I would say I'm relatively familiar with the proc namespace, and I had no idea you could navigate the root file system for each process in this way. <laughs> okay. Normally, cool. this That's... is a highly, I mean, we, we're roots, so we, we have access to privileged system stuff. And from here, where do we want to go? Uh, th this one, uh, you may want to look in temp. So in the temp directory of the other container. And then into temp again. And then into logs again. You might just want to also complete for a bit. <laughs> oh. 
I should have just said no, read them all out to me one by one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I feel bad that I've used the same um, file name twice. Uh, the directory name, rather. There we go. <laughs> Excellent. Fantastic. Um, yet there are two more, and there is a, uh, a mysterious bounty flag hidden later. So let's let's cut it off there and find a time to get the others through, and then maybe run through some of last year's as well. All right. Well, thank you very much. Like, <laughs> uh, I'm learning scary stuff, which is always a wonderful thing to be doing. Like that root directory and the proc thing. I, I don't, that that's wild. I, I don't know so why much. that's a thing, but I'm going to have to, I'm going I'm going to have to look look that up for sure. Um. <laughs> it's a thing because when the kernel and I'm I'm going to butcher this, and please kernel devs correct me, but when the kernel is managing processes, it wants all of that information so that it can do its own introspection. They're just sim links to places. Everything in Linux is a file, so it makes that all available through the proc virtual file system. When we're root inside the container, and here's the, you know, just say this till I'm blue in the face, we have access to all those privileged operations. And so root inside the container can do an awful lot because we're still just using Linux. And that's why we want to elevate to a non-root user. And would that be something that disappears with user namespaces? At least user namespaces perform, oh man, it's a mouthful, subordinate group and user mapping. So where we've got kind of, we used to have one to 64K, we've now got one to 2 billion um, possible user IDs. There's so many because you can then, so you've got your root user namespace. You can then create a, another user namespace on top and that maps zero inside that namespace to 50,000 on the host. And then you can do that again and you can do it to a point of brain melting complexity that we won't think about. So does it go away with user namespaces? Some of the privileged host mounting stuff does go away because we need that permission on the in the the root user namespace. What we did just now, oh, that's uh, <laughs> by design in, in inverted commas. Cool. All right. Well, I'll definitely be losing sleep and turning off all of my production infrastructure tonight. So. <laughs> you did a great job. All right. Well, again, uh, thank you for taking some time out of your day and walking us through this today. It was great fun. And definitely I'm going to get more involved with CTS, I think, and just use them as a learning experience. I think this was a really That's fun and engaging way to learn really lower level components of the kernel and containers that I've probably just been neglecting for a while. So, uh, and it's always a pleasure, but thanks again. Uh, have a great evening and I will speak to you soon. Cheers. Yeah, thoroughly bye. enjoyed.